So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very nervous, um, but uh, this is something and a person that I've had a, a, passion, a growing passion for for a long time. And um, like many books, you start a book. I love reading a wide variety of books, from thrillers to uh, Clive Cussler, if you've read any of his, uh, uh, to uh, church history, as I mentioned, and sermons and messages. Um, but they start with a prologue. So once you use our imagination, um, just going to close your eyes, but the boat ploughed through the North Sea towards the east coast of England. The captain and his crew had travelled this route many times. This time was different. Not only were they carrying flour, but also smuggling banned manuscripts of the first New Testament translated into English from the Greek by a man who was to be called the most dangerous man in Tudor England. Now you might have seen a programme on the television a couple of years by Melvin Bragg. And that was the title that he called it, The Most Dangerous Man in Tudor England. It's an amazing when you think about it, of something like the scriptures which we have, which are in our hands freely. Um, I've got a copy here by David Daniel, whose biography I first came across that uh, really gives you insights into William Tyndale. Um, but this is a copy by Daniel, just just improving on the spellings but not the text of that New Testament uh, from 1526 or 1534 when the second edition was produced and um, how we have the privilege of something like this which we take for granted or whatever version you use today and uh, so what a, pre a preface in a sense is that after that program, in this book called I came across the book of fire by um, Brian Mohanan. Uh, it uh, starts off with a preface on the burden of heretics. And uh, let me just read a bit to you because it puts it better than I could um, in, the, in the preface. Early in the year of our Lord, 1428, the mortal remains of a former rector of the parish were exhumed from beneath the flagstones in the chancel of St Mary's Church in Lutterworth a market town in the English Midlands. An array of powerful men stood out from the plain crowd of local people in the church. Richard Fleming, the Bishop of Lincoln, whose Lutterworth then lay, was present with his chances, suffered from bishops, the priors and abbots of the diocese. The High Sheriff of Leicestershire was attended by his officers. Courtier of canons and lawyers, just to dig a person up. You think it seems crazy to us now, doesn't it? Huddles around as the grave diggers they worked. An executioner even looked on with professional interest. <laughs> Crazy. The coffin was raised and opened, and its contents were exposed to the onlookers. The body was taken out through a small door in the south side of the chancel, and as the dying wreck had been carried out it was by his parishioners 44 years before, after he suffered a stroke while celebrating Mass in December 1384. His remains were born in solemn procession under the dripping yews in the churchyard, along the streets of the town and down the wounded hillside to a bridge near the River Swift. This was the field of execution. Public hangings continued there into coaching days when Lutterworth was an important staging post. They had the kindling and everything ready for it to be burnt. A brief ceremony was held. Bishop Fleming confirmed that he was carrying out the command sent from Rome by Pope Martin V on the 16th of December last. This order, him to carry out the sentence that had been passed on the body in 1415 by the great council of the church at Constance on the German-Swiss border. The councillor condemned 200 propositions put forward by the dead man, John Wycliffe, whose body this was, the former master of Balio College at Oxford and rector of Lutterworth as he touched on core doctrines of the Catholic faith. And so it goes on about what they did. They dressed him in his vestments, stripped him of the vestments, um, scraped his hands, removed the oil, which had been anointed as his ordination, uh, and he was excommunicated, and his soul give, uh, commended his soul to the devil. This was heresy. This was against what the church believed. And Wycliffe, though he died as a 
uh, uh, naturally of a stroke. Here he was now being, going through anybody who had been alive and committed of heresy who was going to be condemned to the stake and the burning. Lollards were the people who um, then were named or those who followed his teachings because his teachings of wanting to put the scriptures into uh, English, he, he translated it from Latin, um, was, uh, which was the language of the church then. That was John Wycliffe. Um, he was an English scholastic philosopher, theologian, Bible translator, reformer, and seminary, seminary professor at Oxford. He was influential in the descent with their own the Roman Catholic priesthood during the 14th century. Wycliffe detached the privileged status of the clergy, which was central to this powerful role, to their powerful role in England. He attacked the luxury and pomp of local parishes and their ceremonies. He wanted to, he was an advocate for a translation of the Bible into the vernacular. He completed a translation from the Vulgate, which I mentioned just now was the Latin Bible, into Middle English in the year 1382. And it became called Wycliffe's Bible. But it was anathema, and, and, and he and, and others were persecuted for it. Although, as we said, he died a, a normal death. So how did this situation happen that, that the country, and the country as well, had this view upon anybody who dissented from the norm? Well, I came across a book some years ago in the shop called by a chap called Leonardo... Leonardo Verdun, or Leonard Verdun, uh, The Reformers and Their Set Children. Has anybody ever come across it? Um, it's still available. It's copyright 964, published by Erdemans. Uh, and it says, all pre-Christian society is sacral. He then goes on to define, explain what it means. Sacral is used as bound together by a common religious loyalty. And he said, I was looking for a definition in Spanish, where obviously we came from. It referred to the sacred rites of, their, of, of what people believed. The church, for instance, put it in plain language, looked after things spiritual, which make up us a human souls and a worship of God. While kings and princes uh, looked after the temple. So sacred and, spirit and temporal, spiritual and temporal, bound together was a sacred society or sacro if I pronounce it, I'm very bad at pronouncing things, uh, embraced religion, what people believed. And the Roman Catholic Church had a uh, monopoly in, in that sense, hasn't it? Believed it was the church under God, the keys given by Peter to the Pope. Um, it was a monolithic society centred around one unanimously embraced religion, says Keith Waters, another person writing on this. A fundamental driving force behind this uh, viewpoint is the idea that societal harmony requires religious unanimity. It assumes that religious diversity always results in a social discord within a sacred society it does. The key to understanding such societies is to realise that there's no distinction between church and state. And I remember, for instance... Uh, as a bookseller, there was debate in the Anglican Church, for instance, very often, every so often, but should the church and state be separated from each other? And the answer was no, we believed it should continue. So, um, but it was more prominent in the Middle Ages and for life for many centuries, wasn't it? So the life and culture was, was uh, sort of, was the way that people lived and culture was. But when, so when people like Wycliffe in, in, on the continent, uh, John Huss, some years later, who said, why can't we have the scripture in the name, in the local people's vernacular? Um, they were looked upon as heretics. They were treasonable, what they were presuming. So, though the church would say, for instance, um, we can condemn them, we cannot take their lives. It's a bit like Pilate, isn't it? Uh, or the Jewish leaders before Pilate saying, um, this man is against our God and that, but we can't kill him. We, he's also against the emperor and handed him over to Pilate, didn't they, the Lord Jesus? Um, but it was that sort of viewpoint that actually maintained then and became part of society. The sacramental system was the way that the whole thing... So in pre-Reformation days, um, these were some of the things that uh, 
defined such a viewpoint on society and life. The priesthood under the Pope held sway and was, he was infallible. Confession was only through a priest the power of absolution of your sin. And just this was penance to deal with the consequence of your confessing your sins. Indulgences had to be bought to be able to, uh, to provide years off purgatory. The Mass became the literal body and blood of Christ, cr transubstantiation. And there was purgatory between passing from this life to the next. Prayer to Mary and the saints were important in dealing with your sin. I had an extraordinary experience, um, a work I supported back in the 60s. Um, this work was supporting Christians in Spain. And in Spain, if you remember, if you know a little bit about your history, was um, very much under, uh, again, like many places were, a Roman Catholic viewpoint on uh, belief system and touched every part of society. Everybody had to um, ask questions of the priest, for instance, if they want to sell Christian books or do something different. And these churches, Protestant churches, had been uh, persecuted. One particular pastor we met, he'd been in prison for his faith. But now, because um, uh, Franco, wasn't it, uh, didn't want to listen to priests and wanted to open up for commerce and for travel, so people go to Spain quite freely now, he opened it up, which meant he had to give more freedom to Protestant Christians, the Baptist or just free evangelicals working in my Pentecostal. He had to give them more freedom if they were going to open up the country. And these Christians that he went to visit were in that position, just able to open their church for the first time. But we were taken around, and of course you could see little chapels little on the roadside, you could know many people from that country's background and other such backgrounds, they'd have little shrines, wouldn't they? And we came across a, <coughs> um, a statue of St Paul. You think, what's got St Paul there for? And the person we translated from the Spanish and said, he said, but well, if you say so many Hail Marys and so many Lord prayer, Lord, Lord of the Lord's Prayer to Paul, you'll have so many days off purgatory. So it was still, even to the 20th century, this viewpoint on the whole and the belief system of people um, was important to them. Um, so it hadn't really completely gone away in many respects, although the, we know the Roman Catholic Church, many of us have friends who still worship in a Roman Catholic church, for instance, where things have changed, particularly since Vatican II. Uh, they're able to even open the word of God more freely now, before they were banned from reading any scriptures, apart from in Latin, the Vulgate, uh, or edition of the Bible. So, anyone suggested the opposite under this society in which life was, was accused of treason, and the law of the land and God, and they were found guilty... They're heretics, as we said, in the eyes of the church and handed over to the secular powers for punishment. This then gives us a viewpoint of the society and of what life was. I've mentioned John Huss, and we've mentioned Wycliffe from that book. He was, uh, they were to suffer the same p fate as Wycliffe. One of the things, apparently, they had in those days of uh, Wycliffe and us, a chant, a bit derogatory, it said... There were three popes, a popular chant was a new version of the creed, I believe in three holy Catholic churches. <laughs> and they had a woman pope, you knew that, didn't you? Um, things were quite uh, extraordinary, and many of them had children who legitimately and so on, yet they condemned anybody who wanted to marry. And poor Luther, when he married, he was condemned because he'd married a nun. And of course, when Luther came on the scene and put his in its 500 years, isn't it, this year, that it's commemorating his nail in the 95 Thesis of protest. He wanted to reform the Catholic Church, but he suffered for it and his truths. And these were things that were beginning to influence society. People's question, for instance, one more thing before we immediately come to, Luth to Luth, um, Tyndale, the literacy rates. People were beginning to um, be able to read for themselves. And I looked this up. At the beginning of the Renaissance, European males had a literacy rate about 5 to 10%. This number varied, of course, in many places. Some urban areas, for instance, merchants might have had a literacy rate as high as 
uh, in the Italian city of Florence, the overall literary rate may have been 25 to 35 percent in the 1330s. How there's a sharp, distinct difference between sex, wealth, and social status and occupation. In England, literacy rates in males may have reached as high as 25% by 1530, perhaps even higher in London. You see, if you read a book, this is quite interesting, you know, by Alistair McGrath, which gives me interest, at the beginning, the story of the King and James Bible, and it touches on it down there, but English was the peasant's language. It was looked down upon. So the language of the church was Latin, the worship was in Latin, and people just mumbled or whatever. But in the education, it was French, because they looked down on English. So it wasn't until around this period that the merchants began to uh, become more prominent, they had the money and so on, who, who supplied the trade for this England. They were saying, for instance, why should our young people be taught in French when we have English? We have a vernacular language. And so it was beginning to grow. It might have been crude in many places, but it became an important language. And then Shakespeare came along, of course, and his flower of using words in his dramas and was an indicative of the way that the English language became strong. So I'd commend that book to you. It's, 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 it's very good. And, of course, then you go on to the advent of printing, 1450. Uh, Johannes, Johannes Gutenberg, who runs, uh, stands out as the invention of movable type. So instead of having, having to be written, and on vellum and songs and manuscripts like that, they could begin to print books. I mean, you might not know, but realise that St Mark, instead of on papyrus, used codices, small little books, to write in the Koinonia Greek his Gospel of Mark, and that was used. And so Paul was able to take that around with him and write as well. It's the way that the language and the way of producing the printed book, but that was all handwritten still, wasn't it, for many centuries, until this chap came along with his movable type. And here in England, William Caxton, 1422 to 91, after learning his trade in mainland Europe, um, produced his first book in the city of Bruges in 1476, and then set up in England, in Westminster, his own printing press. And he, he started printing indulgences because that's where the money was. So if you'd done some sin and that, you knew you had to buy an indulgence where well, they could produce them for nothing to a penny, you know, because it was cheap. And so it's the way that people were making their money and they had a great, great trade, didn't it? It's a bit like Diana of the Ephesians, isn't it, that Paul came across in Ephesus. And, you know, in their worship, in their religion in Ephesus, they had this goddess, Diana, and worshipped her, but they'd sell them. You know, you want your own little goddess statue at home and so on. And so when Paul t uh, uh, prayed for this young woman, cast out the spirit of divination, and they lost their living, living the, the people, that the whole place, it says, was an uproar. This was uh, against the sacral society. So you can see how this word, if you've never come across it before, was an important part, the, the way that belief system and the way the, the secular authorities uh, worked together and made up society. So that was the advent of printing. And across Europe, the, the, the call was for a Bible in living languages, uh, uh, in Western Europe particularly. And England was to be no exception. So the emergence of more influential middle class, as we said, gradually influenced this, and English was being asked to be more used. So... We come to our subject more, and I hope that's just given a brief background of what society was like. What the demand was, and why people wanted the sacred scriptures in their own language. Um, we sang yesterday, for instance, uh, at North Walsham, How Great Thou Art, uh, by Hein, who was an English um, uh, missionary in Russia and heard the, the song and, and translated it. I, I, his daughter, I believe, is still alive in Walter on Thames. Um, but um, she, she was telling us how the people in Peru, where she worked as a missionary with the Whitecliffe Bible translators, um, were so thrilled when they had the scriptures, instead of in Spanish, had it in their own local dialects that they could understand it, speak in my language.
I could understand now what they're saying. But everything was perhaps gobbledygook because of that language. It was and, and the pressure upon. But now they could use their own language and teach their own children the language they spoke every day. They had the scriptures of God, the Old and New Testament, in their own language. So this is where we come to um, to our subject today. A scripture which comes to life here, and I've used it from the Tyndale's New Testament, is Paul writing to Timothy, where the scripture talks about scripture itself. Paul says to Timothy, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, which were also were committed unto thee, seeing thou knowest of whom thou hast learned them, and for much as also as thou hast been known holy scripture of a child. <clears throat> it means a little bit wordy for us today, but you get the hints of it. This was the literal words that he was using in his New Testament. We're committed to thee, seeing thou knowest of them as they have before. From the holy scripture as a child, which is able to make thee the wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And this is the famous verse you might know off by heart. So when I became a Christian, which I learned off by heart, for all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable to teach, to improve, to amend and instruct in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and prepared unto all good works. That's in how Tyndale translates the Greek into English. Plain, simple, clear. Or one, P or Peter uh, is writing uh, uh, later on to the Christians, where he says this: "So you know this, that no prophecy in Scripture hath any private interpretation, for the Scripture never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, as the Holy Spirit, as we say now." So there's scripture commenting on its purpose and its meaning for us human beings, that we might know God clearly and plainly and understand and put these truths into practice in our own personal lives. This is, in a sense, really, it must have been what was behind William Tyndale as he grew up. He was born in Gloucestershire, and around, they're not exactly sure, but going back from some points of life, it comes about 1494, 1495. The family used the name Hutchins. It's quite interesting, the names that they, they'd use, and some people changed, they moved around Europe, changed their spellings of their names or whatever, didn't they? But uh, Tyndale was one of them, but oh, no, Hutchins, no, Hutchins. It was a great cosmopolitan area where he lived, a much commons pass through the air and down at Bristol, for instance, not far away. And he would hear all these different languages and dialects, and he was a very gifted young man as he grew up, to began to absorb these languages. He could know about 11 languages. Quite amazing. Um, one of the places where he was schooled was Watson Under the Edge. Now, I've done a little bit about my family tree. Uh, I'm a slatter. Uh, my father's father was a journeyman, means... He had no set place, but he moved around painting, decorating, and so on. His father lived in Twickenham, where my father's from, but his father came from Wotton on the Edge and other towns uh, in the Gloucestershire, Cheltenham area. Quite interesting. So that's where he had some his school in. <coughs> we then found out that he stu studied the college at Magdalen College School and went to Magdalen Hall, now Hartford School. Uh, in Oxford, where he got his, he obtained his BA. And in 1512, uh, and his MA in 1515. It is believed there's some questions about how or when he went to Cambridge. And we've mentioned already this whole way that people across the continent were beginning to want the, the Bible into their own language. And Luther and his uh, viewpoint, wanting to reform the Catholic Church, but being forced out of it, began to question and put in print why he defied the rule of the Catholic Church of those days. Um, but he went to Cambridge. So Cambridge, some of these ideas have been holding on to people and, and exciting people as to how they could have the scriptures in their own language. 
and the truths that are suddenly becoming alive to them. Man is justified by faith alone, for instance, was one of the main tenets that was being proclaimed. Um, but he was there, and it says in his own words that he made his abode a certain space being now ripened in the knowledge of God's word. So he was beginning to read these forbidden scriptures himself, along with others, and discuss them. And there was a, a burning within his own heart and soul. And this book, A Book of Fire, I've come across. Some of the things I've lifted from there, so they're not all mine. Uh, but I commend this book by, Mon by Monaghan, Brian Monaghan. It's called William Tyndale and Thomas More and the Bloody Birth of the English Bible. <laughs> and, uh, w which is true, what it was. People lost their lives for holding these truths, which we take for granted today. So this was the background to, to William Tyndale. Um, man in being influenced by these truths. Oh, Erasmus had uh, come from the continent and taught in England. He had produced a book of the Greek New Testament uh, in 1516. And he might, whether he met him or not, or he heard people who had met Erasmus. And these were the things that began to fashion and forge this longing in uh, Tyndale's life. After he graduated, he went to... Um, uh, I was employed at Little Sodbury by uh, Sir John Walsh in Gloucestershire. He was as his tutor to his children. Um, he was about now 27. Tintel had been greatly influenced at this time, as we've said, by Cambridge and, as it, and uh, was, was teaching people. But the oldest child of uh, these people, Morris, died of seven, age seven, by burns of a freak storm after a fiery sulphurous globe rolled him through the parlour door and struck him as he sat dining during the thunderstorm. So as he was one of the main children that he was teaching, he had more time on his hands. He had more time to indulge his passion for debate. He loved debate. Obviously he'd learnt this at Oxford, which was drier than Cambridge, but these truths that he was beginning to grip his heart, um, he'd love to go outside and share them with the public. and He didn't want to keep them to himself, so he began to preach and debate. Um, he was, he'd go a, a far afield to find a large audience. He wished to go down to Bristol. That's an Aunt Austin's Green, it mentions, where a large patch of ground in front of the old Augustian convent in Bristol, now called College, College Green. How, here, wandering preachers uh, gave our fresco uh, sermons and harangued passers-by. Um, so he began to horn these truths that he was learning, which he's wanting to share with people at large. Sermons, of course, were preached in English. It wasn't just in Latin, which people used in the church, and it became more popular. But, and this is where the but happens, opposition, the clouds of opposition, began to roll. You see, uh, Sir Walsh and his, his wife, Lady Walsh, uh, had a, he was a very rich merchant <coughs> and had an open table and lots of the clerics were around there and the friars and so on would be invited to a meal. And Tyndale was invited as well. And they'd get on to these new views that they'd hear about Luther and Tyndale would begin to share his passion of what he was discovering and wanted to pass on. And this began to get him into trouble. He was found debating with the churchly, the, with the church and they took offence and sought to turn Tyndale's employers against him. And they took them aside and began to say, look, this man's te teaching you, you know, truths which are not real truths and which are against the church and tried to turn Tyndale against them. And they harangued uh, uh, Walsh and his wife, took uh, hold of uh, Tyndale and said, look, we're told that you're, you're teaching heresy. And... He was a bit naive, and he was later on, as we'll see, towards the end of his life. But he was very wise. He didn't say much, but he did begin to write out something for Erasmus, which showed, and in showing that the truths he was actually beginning to share were actually true truth, what God's word said, and which we need to listen to, and not just for the church. You see, 
The church's view on scripture was it was under the church. The church and its views from the Pope were the first. And any scripture must be interpreted by the church. The lay person would be too ignorant to be able to understand scripture for themselves and to pass an opinion on it. So that's why they had a hold on society. And began to call him a heretic in logic and divinity. And uh, he had to answer this, but he began to win his employer's viewpoint round, and they still supported him and spoke against these uh, so-called clerics and friars, and uh, they didn't come for the free meal anymore. But, <laughs> and there's the other but, they told other people about this. Nothing could be proved from the incident that he was taken before John Bell, uh, who was the Gloucester Chancellor and Chief Administrator of the Justice. And, and uh, in 1523, Tyndale was su summoned uh, before him, but no formal charges came out of this. They couldn't find the name of the, uh, the unknown, uh, they were unknown, the accusers, and any proof that his logic was actually heretical. Not can be proved, but were not forgotten. Because later, after Thomas More, who became Chancellor and one of the most important men in England under Henry VIII, he picked up this story of this accusation and began to say there's something in what they were, they were saying and uh, became the enemy and, and Wolsey as well of uh, Tyndale. Thomas More had become ascended to being Chancellor and obsessed by Lutheranism and was hated to his very bit. It's a bit like Paul, uh, you know, get spitted out threatenings and slaughter and trying to drag people. And this is what he was doing. Anybody that was found teaching these truths was a heretic, but also treasonable and against the king. So that's where they had the power on holding people in this place under their viewpoint of society. So Henry VIII even began to fear what Tyndale was beginning to teach. And he was going to become the dangerous enemy of the land. We've mentioned about Luther's work and how it was gaining ground. It was a bit like an infection which was spreading, a bit like the plague had been. But this was truth which was begin to grip men's souls and hearts. And if truth grips people's hearts and souls, it's not like a physical illness, is it? It's something which cannot just be solved overnight with a pill. Because we are spiritual beings, aren't we? We are people who have been made in the image of God. Who God who has communicated, as Francis Schaeffer uh, a Christian philosopher a few years ago would say, true truth to enable us to know this God who has created the world and who wants us to have a relationship with him. And because of sin in our lives, has shown us through the scriptures how we might be forgiven, not just through a church, but through the man Christ Jesus who invented the church, who is the head of the church. So um, these are sort of the truths that will be actually uh, a question they had. So, this is the situation. The opposition clouds are beginning to come about the life of William Tyndale. I mentioned just now that he was a bit naive and he had an introductory uh, letter from Walsh to the Bishop of London, uh, Cuthbert Tunstall. Uh, the Bishop of London had this letter but for a year, he was so busy, you see, many of them weren't just clergy. They were political, they had business, they were lawyers, they were whole lots of other things. They didn't just care for souls. It was part of the package. And um, Tyndale used to debate with people, uh, as we've said. Um, and in 1523, this desire to begin to translate the Bible took hold of him would not go away. I don't know if you've ever found God guiding your life. And it's a very difficult thing to explain, but I know as a young person, for instance, when I really came to know the Lord Jesus myself, I began to say, Lord, 
How do you want me to live my life? Just an ordinary job as a butcher, which I was doing now for dear old Sainsbury's? Or have you got something else for me to do? do you, I, I, I'm going to want to share God's word with people. And by faith, I had to step out. And this is what Tyndale was doing. He had this letter of introduction from Walsh to Tunstall. Um, but he could be naive because just even before then, he had been debating with some learned divine, so-called. And uh, Tyndale, in anger, as it were, against the untruths that this chap was putting over, said, if God spare my life, he said, he added, ere many years I will cause a boy that driveth the plough shall know more of the scripture than thou dost, or thou doest. It's best what's spelt out in the old English. Is. <laughs> um, that was the truth that was beginning to grip the heart of Tyndale. And why his employer gave him this letter, he thought naively it was a good introduction to the Bishop of London, who held sway to enable him to begin to do this. But he was very wrong. So he went to London, looking for a patron to support him. And you can read about that on pages 36 to 37 there. He sought counsel, counsel, uh, Cuthbert Tunsil, as we said, with this letter. But he didn't see him for a year. And when he did, I've got no room in my house for you. And hang on a minute, what you're wanting to do is not right. So Tyndale was refused patronage and was angry. He preached some sermons in the church of St. Dustin's in, Flute, in the west in Fleet Street. But among the congregation, this is the marvellous thing, you see, where God has gone before and prepared a person's life. That he loves each one of us and has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And this person was a person called Humphrey Monmouth, who was a, a rich merchant. He was kindly, a wealth, wealth, uh, he was a wealthy cloth merchant. And among others, there's a place called the Steel Yard, where many merchants like him have been gripped by the truths that were coming from the continent about scripture and about knowing God personally. And he said he would support Tyndale. He heard him preaching and uh, he began to support him and, and sent him with some money in the spring 1524 across the, uh, the sea. So the printing of the New Testament the way that Tyndale was able to have to print his New Testament. He had hardly any money. Just picture this, a bit like me when I started the bookshop in Culture in, culture in 67. I had no money. But through various events, people saying to me, I believe God is calling you to Christian book work. You begin to see then how God has opened the, ha the, the way for you and provided money to enable you to... I was told about, oh, you need about £10,000 to start a Christian bookshop. That was 67. I had about 500 pounds <laughs> but God brought situations about a shop and so on prepared the way and this is what Tyndale found with Monmouth and the people that he contacted what were some of the things then that uh, he began to translate from the Greek Erasmus Greek into English well for instance the word congregational he didn't translate it as church he wrote it as congregational. That is what the scripture in the Greek was saying. This was an alarm bell to the speakers in any place in England, in the place of the church. Instead of priest, he used the word senior or elder. Interesting, isn't it? He began to see that we are the priesthood of all believers, as Peter would say. Every person who by faith in Jesus Christ has been justified by faith, come to know the Lord, asked him to be their saviour, whatever words you use. They are a priest before God, a holy priesthood to everybody. There are people who are called to be ministers and leaders and to be recognised and supported, but he translated as senior or elder from the Greek, stressing the absence of any priestly hierarchy in scriptural terms. He rendered the word Greek word for repent instead of do penance. And the huge invested interest 
it, it was invested, we've said already, about indulgences and so on, to do penance. If you're confessing your sins, well, you've got to pay money out and you've got to then do this and that, or you've got to buy this little bit of paper that said you've got so many years off purgatory. It's not in the scripture he began to bring out from the Greek. The word love, instead of charity, and all that again that meant, now abideth, as Corinth was saying, this is what is from his Greek New Testament, hope, faith, hope, and love, even these three, but the chief of these is love rather than charity. Because charity meant money again. Fascinating, isn't it? Simple words that we can, uh, t- we take for granted today, but which... Uh, for them was mind blowing. And so his first edition came about in 1526. Um, he got betrayed uh, in, uh, and, uh, from that and he had to flee again, leaving his manuscripts. Some of them came in in uh, 1526 as we started off in our picture of the prologue of the ship carrying his New Testament power when he reprinted it. Um, but, but they were pirated editions as well. But these people who were sympathetic merchants who knew the steel yard people in, in England came in with their barrels of flour and smuggled those New Testaments down in little chambers in the barrels of flour. It's like, you know, the, the Solcott, where my wife's father came from, uh, just up the road from us in Essex, um, that was known for smuggling in because it was like all the creeks. I mean, you heard maybe on the news recently of, of people from abroad being smuggled in as migrants and little boats and that because it was hard, no customs people around or anything. And um, in a similar way that there was again into London and places, even here up in Norfolk, they, they smuggled in this Greek New Testament. But also as many good things, there are pirate editions because some of those people who were um, in the printing trade, although it was banned, they began to do their own editions and, and slight twists and that, and, and um, it became quite difficult. But it's a bit like I was, thinking, I was thinking about that and came across that. I was thinking about Paul again, saying that people, some people are preaching Christ out of envy. He said, but I'm, as long as Christ is being preached... I'm content. And I suppose this is the same with with William Tinder. Although people were putting some of their own copies of the scripture out under his name, but really it would have been twists. They'd done copies themselves and with this movable type and mistakes. He rejoiced that the scriptures were getting in. And of course, then what happened was the Bishop of London began to hear this under Wolsey, or Wolfsey, as um, Tyndale called him, his enemy. And they get by them, and they bought them and buy them. And there's a lovely story of, even with the pirated or actual editions of Tyndale, that they, the bishop would give money out to people to find out who was just shipping them, go and buy them all up. And they were asked for a high price. They even told Tyndale this was happening. And from the money that they were buying from them, from his merchants, actually that money actually helped buy, pay for more editions of the real scriptures to be produced. So it backfired on the Bishop of London. <laughs> but he had all these bonfires in London, as well as up here in Norwich and, and places where these scriptures that were against the rule of the land and the church, it couldn't be stopped. So not only in 1526, but was in part editions, the word of God, and even the word of God, the scriptures came to Anne Boleyn, the Queen's new wife. <coughs> Tyndale wasn't happy actually that the king was going to remarry but um, she heard about him and had his scriptures and some of his other writings and even tried to influence King Henry VIII that here was truth but the king was set on having his marriage annulled and eventually as we know married her and um, it's sad that not long after Henry Moore who was then accused of treason because he opposed uh, the king's divorce and lost his own life. Uh, Anne Boleyn died a few days later, was, had her head chopped off. 
Tyndall was elusive in a marvellous way. Nobody knew where he lived, didn't really know what he looked like, didn't have a photo stat or on their phones could say, oh, look, it's the picture of William Tyndall. Ah, uh, he's the man we can see. So all this period, he was elusive. And he was able to escape the enemies who were after him. People like Frith, Frith and Bilney, isn't it? Yeah, Bine, Bilney, uh, from, from Norwich, weren't so fortunate. People who, these were men who had discovered the truth of God's word and began to preach it in England and began to share the scriptures and many others like them. In the Old Testament book of fire it talks about this and David Daniel in his book about the life of, uh, he passed away last uh, year but he's brought about this, this whole story of Tina, I uh, commend it to you. I'll say also he's the one who has uh, done this English, English, English edition of uh, his New Testament uh, for us to be able to read in the scriptures. And the amazing thing is that the scripture that Tyndale produced, which was banned, and that he eventually lost his life for, as we'll see in a second, as a heretic, became the bulwark of the New King James Bible, of the King James Bible some years later. 95% of the, the King James, or the authorised version, as might I like to call it, was Tyndale's work. Amazing, isn't it? As we said, Anne Boleyn, she was uh, very much a patron, su and supported some of those in England who would begin to share these truths. Uh, uh, but uh, she had no real joy in turning uh, the king's head and even lost her own life in the end after she was betrayed herself. But we said Tyndale himself is elusive. But by 1532, he was in Antwerp. In 1534, he was able to bring out his second corrected edition of his New Testament. But also, the amazing thing we said about Tyndale was, he was beginning to learn Hebrew. And so he was beginning to produce parts of the Old Testament. And I uh, haven't been able to get hold of it, um, but it's, it's only in a hardback. It's cost about £80. I've ordered it from the library to look again. There's a copy of the, what he did of the Pentateuch and up to the Psalms, books of Jonah, uh, Isaiah. Uh, so that, the, again, the people of England, you and I, could have the scripture in our own language, vernacular language. We come now to, the, to the, the last part of our story of Tyndale. He was betrayed, we said it's a bit naive, but there was a place in Antwerp called the English House. And uh, he had safe, a bit like an ambassador's house, that anybody who lived in there was quite safe. If they went outside, they could perhaps be arrested and lose their life. Tyndale was there for quite a few, a couple of years or so, and had the support of the, uh, the person who owned that house. But in 1534, he was betrayed. 35, he was betrayed. A chap called Henry Phillips came. He was a bit of a usurper and a bit of a con man. And uh, he made himself known, first of all, to the, uh, the patron of the house, and uh, Tyndale wasn't in that day. He came back again and got to know Tyndale and twisted Tyndale around his, uh, freely around his own self, uh, began to get to know him. He said, well, why don't you come out for a meal with me? And in the end, Tyndale did. But what had happened was that Phillips had spoken to the authorities of that area, which was very Catholic and against the teachings of Lutheran, uh, teaching and arranged a bit like Judas to uh, betray him for some money because he was always after money and always losing it and gambling it and so on for Phillips which they found out afterwards so on the 25th of 1st of May 1535 uh, William Tyndale was betrayed and arrested and taken to a castle uh, and he was there for about two years and uh, they had this mock trial, the, uh, the, uh, the bishops and so on, got to try to get him into cans and find out what he believed, what he didn't believe. Um, 
but they convicted him of heresy. Henry, through Cromwell, his minister then, because More was now da- died and Wolsey was dead, sent letters to try uh, to the King of Spain, who was the nephew of Catherine, who had now died, uh, the first queen, um, to try and release Tyndale, but to no avail, because he was armed and he was uh, obviously against any uh, annulment of uh, Henry's marriage. Marriage he'd gone on to, uh, to take place. And so these letters came to nothing to try and release Tyndale. Tyndale said uh, that his, his body, um, that he, he was prepared to live and also to die for his Lord. Tyndale said, did not die for charity, he died for love, for the love of God's word and their readers. And uh, just read this uh, last piece, uh, which talks about uh, Tyndale um, as he died. Eight years before he had anticipated his death, there's none other way into the kingdom of life than through persecution and suffering and pain, he wrote. And a very death after the example of Christ. In this belief, at least, and in the firmness of their faith, he and more are one. He did not write his own epitaph, a passage he left from 1 Corinthians, serves well. And though I give my body, even as I burned, and yet had no love, it profited me nothing. He used love, not that word charity note. It was technical evidence of his heresy, of course, and the prime reason why more wanted him burnt. And... Uh, But Tyndale did not die for charity, he died for love, for the love of God's words and their readers, and for the most familiar work in the English language is thereby given the added grace of being a labour of love. And when he was finally convicted and he was taken to the, the stake, they tried to strangle him first but he wasn't completely killed, and the, the flames came up and burnt him. And he was heard to cry, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. What a prayer. Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And that happened a few years later that they allowed what was called Matthew's Bible to be printed. But the majority of it was actually the work of Tyndale. Even the Old Testament books which he'd been working on became part of that, and as we know in our own heritage, I mentioned before in the actual King James Bible, the majority of it is 95%, it's been proved, is the work of Tin, William Tyndale. What a heritage, what a legacy, out of love, a labour of love, that you and I today, in 2017, have the privilege of God's word in our own language that we can understand that we don't have to go through a priest or anybody else, that we have immediate access by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, have our sins forgiven and have our lives changed and directed by the Spirit of God. And that's congregationalism, that we have the Holy Spirit freely to guide us and lead us. Yes, it can be open for abuse, but you see, the Spirit of God always leads into truth and that your life and my life can be used to touch other people, that they might find that same love and live our lives as a labour of love. Amen.